What's up, guys? Welcome to another flow class. How's everyone doing today? Have we traded today? Are we green? Are we red? What's going on out there? We are going to look at some options flow today. Want to make sure you guys understand what we're looking at with this scanner. Some of the things we're looking for, some of the things we're looking to avoid. Good morning, Shannon. How many of you guys are not members of Black Box Stocks? I did post this link on Twitter, so we might have some people that are not members of Black Box. That happens to be the software that I use for unusual options activity. So I'm going to show you that platform today and explain what we're looking for, what we're not looking for, some of the tips that we use to try to find some good flow. On the screen right now, you see my setup. So in the middle here, I run the options flow because I am an options trader. We do have stocks over here if you trade stocks. This is a pretty comprehensive scanner. So I trade pretty much options only. So I have options in the middle and I like to keep the news over here on this section. So what that does is when I pull up a ticker, any news that's associated with it, the fly on the wall is a subscription service, but it's free with Blackbox. And it populates right here anytime I pull up a ticker. So my preferred setup is to have the options flow over here and the news over here. So what you see on the screen right now is real-time options flow. These are actual trades that are being placed right now on exchanges by actual traders. So the thing about a scanner, a lot of people, some they send me messages every day pretty much saying, hey, today I didn't see any flow in this particular ticker or there was no action going on for this. What's going on? Why is the scanner not picking it up? So what the scanner is doing is it's not creating any kind of trade information. It's not picking up information and telling us you should trade this, you should trade that. What it's doing is just reporting what other traders are, are trading. So right now we just had three Gilead trades, four come in, they're different strikes different expirations, but these are trades that someone just placed on the exchange. And if you look at the timestamp, 8.03.37, I am on the West Coast. So that is, what is that? That is 11.03 on the East Coast. If you look at your clock right now, it is exactly that time frame. So this information is coming across in real time, and I'm gonna show you some slides that are going to explain what we're looking at here. But this is all information coming in in real time. And what it's actually doing is reporting these trades that are being executed on the exchanges by these traders. So again, Black Box isn't really creating any kind of trade data. It's reporting what's executed on the exchanges that the algo criteria has been met for. So we're not scanning for an Apple trade for five contracts. If I go in and I buy Netflix and I buy three contracts, the scanner's not gonna show us that because no one cares about that. I don't have the ability to move the markets or the ability to really determine what's going on with a huge research team and really influence people to go buy this particular ticker because I'm not doing dollar volume that's really going to impact anything. So we're not really looking for that. So when I get some messages that say, hey, I saw some action in this particular ticker, how come it wasn't picked up by the scanner? It didn't meet the scanner's criteria. It's that simple. So it's not saying that it never traded. What Blackbox is picking up is all the trades on the exchange that meet these specific algos criteria. So you can see as this is filtering in, these are trades that are actually placed and executed on the exchange as we see them on the scanner. So this Beyond trade, someone just put $35,000 into Beyond and it literally just executed for them. Someone just put 
49,000, 23,000 in LPLA, 135,000 in Apple, 121,000 in ADI. These are trades that are being executed on the exchange as we're seeing them come across the scanner. So there's no delay. So what we're seeing on the screen is as it's happening. Really important if we're trying to find trades that we want to piggyback on, super important to be able to track these trades and act upon them as they're happening. Here's one of the advantages of black box over the competition is that we do provide this in real time. So these trades that you see scanning across the screen right now, they're being executed as they're on the screen. You can actually go to the exchanges and get this information for free, but it will be delayed by 20 minutes. So if you get the information for free, these ABBV 98 calls that just executed, we'll see that it happened at 8.06 in the morning, but I won't see them on my screen until 8.26. Now, a 20 minute delay is free, but the problem is sometimes these trades were actually in and out of them in less than 20 minutes. So by the time it hits the scanner, the information is no good to me. So the thing about Blackbox is that we pay for real-time data, which is really expensive, but Blackbox feels it's worth it for everyone to have that real-time data. So we're basically putting our money into trades that we're following a big money trader. We don't want to know what they did 20 minutes ago. We want to know that as it's happening. So with this particular scanner, we get this information in real time and we're going to look at these trades to determine whether or not it's something we want to follow with our own money. So you can see a lot of JPM put sweeps just came through. There's something significant about the yellow, and I'm gonna to get to that a little bit later. The colors on the scanner are telling me one thing. We also have information on the spread, so I have information on whether these are opening or closing positions. Another advantage to black box, some of the competition doesn't show you that. So it's also gonna tell me, if I follow one of these traders into a trade, I can see when they're flipping out of those trades. So very important to know that as well. If I'm following a big money trader into a trade, I can see when they pull their money out of that trade. And it doesn't mean I have to pull my money out, but if I know that they put $300,000 into the market and now they're pulling out 300 plus or minus their gains or losses, that's a good indication for me to pull up the chart, maybe kind of analyze what's going on with it. And if they pull their money out, maybe I want to. I don't have to pull mine out, but if I follow them into the trade, I wanna know when they're coming out of the trade. So the spread information is gonna give me information on whether these are opening or closing trades. And that's gonna be really helpful as far as trades that I followed. And it's also really important to understand because if you see a bunch of, so these right here, these are calls. I'll get to this in a little bit, but the B means these traded on the bid. Now these are different tickers here, but let's assume they were the same ticker. And I start seeing a bunch of calls coming in on the bid and I don't pay attention to the actual spread portion. I just see calls coming across the screen. If I open that call position, that's a low probability trade because the person that I'm following isn't actually opening the position, they're closing their position. So it's really important to understand the spread and this scanner gives us all the information we're really looking for in such an easy to read display. And I'm gonna go over the details of what we're looking at as well. But I wanna give you guys an example of a few things that we would see coming across the scanner. So this is what my setup looks like. I like the, the news over here. This is just gonna filter throughout the day. And when I put in a ticker, it's gonna change the news section to news for that particular ticker. We saw something interesting today on Snap. One of the things that came in on Snap are these. Now, these are leaps. This is for January of 2022. So I'm gonna to touch upon this in a little bit as well. But one thing I wanna say now, 
know the type of trader that you are. If you like short-term trading and you like quick gains, this would not be the type of flow that you want to follow. Because these are going out to January, these may or may not move in price today. They could, but for someone buying expiration out to January, they're expecting a move to happen over the next year. They're not expecting these to move quickly in the next week or two, or they would not be spending the premium to buy a year out when they could get a contract for a month out for much less. So what we're looking at here is a leap. This is for January, 2022, $35 calls. The colors again are important and I'm gonna go over that. But if you look here, 6,600 contracts, 3,300 contracts, 1,000, 1,000. There's a few hundred mixed in here. This is flow that's gonna capture our attention. And if you like to trade leaps, this would be something that someone just put a large amount of money into this particular contract. And if you like leaps, this might be something that you'd want to follow. So these are the types of things we're looking for. The OI on SNAP is 1,005. And the first trade we see on this is 6,648 contracts. 3,300 contracts, 1,000, 1,100, 2,700, 29,000 contracts. So if someone's putting this much money into something, that's what's gonna capture our attention and make us decide, I like their idea, I'm gonna follow it, or I don't agree with what they're doing, I'm not gonna follow it. So these are the types of things we're looking for. I'm gonna give you a few examples then I'm gonna go back to the full real-time flow to give you an example of what we're seeing that's different from what we're seeing on the screen right now. And then I'm gonna go into what it all means and how we use it. So that's Snap. AMD, what I wanna point out on AMD is we had some action on 214.54 is what I'm looking for. So this is all the flow that came in today. And one thing that I like to track from this particular scanner is the first above the ask trade that we see for the day. And I'll explain that in a little bit, but the first above the ask trade we saw today was AMD. And so the first above the ask trade we see for the day basically tells me there's an urgency to get into this trade. And it happened to be AMD today. So it wasn't this particular contract. It was actually the 56 that was the first one of the day. But the 54s are the flow that I'm gonna point out to you guys. Now, again, the colors mean something. I'm gonna to get to that. But look at how much flow came in. This is 6.30.57. So 57 seconds after the market opened, this trade was placed. 631, 634, 636, 637, 641, 42, 45, 51, 52, 54, 59, 659. So all of this happened within a half hour. And then if I scroll up, there's even more of it, 726. So what I wanna point out here, the spread is important. Again, we'll get to that. So these are actually bid and below bid. When we start seeing some ask side, these contracts are $1.24, $1.30, $1.42. So the contracts are starting to increase in price. One thing I want to point out, if I can find here, this is the chart for AMD today. So those contracts were coming in at the opening bell and up to about an hour into the day. So, this is all pre-market, this shaded area, the dark black area is regular time. So let's zoom in on that. This was the first candle of the day. AMD was trading around $53. An hour into the market, we hit $1.50 up from about the opening. And then it kind of leveled off a little bit and dropped. So the first above the ask trade was AMD. It showed some urgency to open this trade and AMD ran $1.50.
within the first half hour of the market. So you saw those contracts kind of increasing a little bit from a dollar, what did I say, a dollar twenty to a dollar forty ish, a dollar fifty. So that's some of the stuff that we're looking for is continued flow. Where's the money coming in and out of? Lulu was another one. These two twenty one two sixties. So here's an example of the type of flow that we're looking for. Again, 631.55. So a minute, almost two minutes into the market, we start seeing some action on Lulu. The first trade was an ask sweep for 99 cents. If you look at the timestamp, these are all really quickly. These are just coming in back to back to back, 635, 634, 633, 633, 633, 632. So all of this is in a four minute window. Then 10 minutes later, there's some action. Almost an hour later, there's more. But what I wanna point out on this one is this first sweep came in at 99 cents, followed by another one for $1.17, followed by another one for $1.25. Then we go to $1.27, $1.33, $1.52, It dropped a little bit to $1.60. This is the type of flow that we're looking for, though. If you see something coming in at a dollar, and then it's all the way up here at $1.52, $1.53, these increased 50% just from the time the first trade came across the scanner. But this AA means it's above the ask. So this is someone adding to this position. So even though these contracts are up 50%, they're not closing these out for profit. They're adding more to their position. That's a good sign. So that's the type of stuff we're looking for from the scanner. We see something come in for a dollar. It goes to $1.17, $1.25, and then it turns purple. And again, I'm gonna explain the colors in a little bit, but that's important to us. And we see the price going from 99 up to $1.30, $1.50, So this is a 100% trade at this point, from 99 cents to 204. That's the type of flow we're looking for. So what we're doing when we're scanning for unusual options activity is we're trying to find what the big money, the smart money is doing with their cash. So when someone starts piling money into a particular ticker with a, a consistency of the same strike and same expiration, if you look at this, these are all 221, 260s. So they're not guessing at the time frame or the price. This is a very specific time frame with a specific price. If there was 260s, 270s, 250s, 200s, 360s, if it was all over the place, there isn't really a story that's being told there. But these are the same strike, same expiration. So there's a consistency here. In a very short time frame, they're just buying, 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 buying. And these contracts went from 99 cents to 204. So that's the type of flow we're looking for. That's what unusual options activity is all about. We're trying to find what the big money is doing as they're doing it. And then we're going to decide if we want to piggyback on their idea or not. So the benefit of having this scanner in front of us, scanning in real time, is that we see these trades as they're placed. So as they actually get executed on the exchange, we see them happening. And I'll go to the real time settings here. By the way, if you see the news, over here it says Lulu now, because I was on Lulu. So you can see the news will filter into only Lulu news. That's why I like to have this set up here. When I click a ticker, if I click on Tesla, the news changes to Tesla news. So that's why I like to have this news section over here. But again, so the benefit of having the scanner in real time is we see these trades as they're executed. Now, a lot of people will be glued to CNBC around lunchtime. There's a segment on there where they call out unusual activity. A lot of times we can know what they're gonna call out without being a part of the CNBC team because we see these trades happening in real time. So a lot of times we'll find all this unusual activity 
And in our chat room, you'll hear us kind of calling out, hey, this could be a CNBC play. And the reason for that is because we kind of have a feel of what the scanner's showing us. We have a feel for what kind of trades they're really picking out and showing. And we're seeing it in real time. So when we're getting in at 9.35, 937 10 o'clock we're in at the same time the traders placing the trade two hours later three hours later whenever the segment runs people are seeing that on cnbc they're piling into that trade at that point also the thing is we've been in that trade for two or three hours because we saw the activity coming in across the screen in real time and a lot of times what happens is you'll see it on tv a lot of people see that on TV and pile into those contracts that are called out. The IV will get a boost. The demand will get a boost. You'll see those contracts increase in price. A lot of times we will actually exit that position as they're calling it out on TV. Because on TV, they're creating a demand for it. So people pile into it. And we've been in it already because we saw when these trades were being placed. Not when they're calling them out. We saw when they actually were placed. So we're getting in as it's being pumped, or we're getting in early. As it's being pumped on TV, we're watching for our exit. Because a lot of times they'll pump it on TV, people pile in, and then it's going to pull back a little bit. So we're able to capture a bigger move because we're in as the trade is placed. It's pumped on TV, people pile into it. At that point, they're chasing it already. It might be up 20, 30%. We're getting out of it as they're pumping it on TV, creating that demand for it. So the benefit of our scanner is that we're seeing these trades placed as they're being placed. And then if it's pumped on TV, when people pile in, that's when we can actually get out of the trade. Now, it doesn't mean we will get out. It depends on the trade itself, depends on our risk tolerance and comfort level. But we can get out of that trade because we got into it the same time the trader got into it, not necessarily waiting for when it's pumped on TV. So that's basically what unusual options activity is all about. We're trying to find what the big money is doing and deciding whether or not we want to piggyback on their idea. So for retail traders, there's a lot of information that we need to be able to decipher. And the ones who are successful are the ones who are going to put in some time and effort into really learning the craft. If you want to use a tool like a scanner, the successful people are going to be the ones who really understand the platform and understand what it's showing us. And there are some confusing things about it, which I'm going to go over today. So thank you for joining us. We do have a lot of different types of traders in our group. We have scalpers, day traders, swingers. There's people that do some investing. So the thing about the scanner is it's really going to give you types of trades that you can place regardless of the type of trader that you are. I showed you some leaps earlier. So if you're a long-term trader, we do have leaps come across the scanner. If you're a short-term trader, we do have alerts that come out for weekly expirations. So regardless of the type of trade that you place, the scanner is going to pick up information that you can basically piggyback on if you like the trade. There's a few things to black box. We are a stock scanner, option scanner. We do have a text and voice chat room. We have some TOS scripts. A lot of people find them useful. If you're looking for something specific, we've got a room where they're all grouped together. We do have live dark pull data. We have private Twitter alerts. We have the fly news. After hours, we have a lot of discussion groups. So if any of this is confusing that I go over today, you can always reach out after hours. And we do have a lot of sometimes just random seminars. Someone asks a question, we'll get on there, we'll start talking about it. And then what do you know? An hour and a half, two hours later, we're still all talking about different topics at that point. But we've expanded from what we started with into a big group of random topics. So Blackbox is a scanner, but it's more also a community. 
And the better the community is, the stronger we're gonna be as a group. So that's part of what today is about, is to make sure you guys really understand what you're seeing from the scanner. Important notes. Like I said earlier, Blackbox isn't creating any kind of trade information. All it's doing is reporting trades that other people have been placing. So when we see something come across the scanner, it's not really anyone determining this is something you should really look at. Let's make this trade. It's a trade that someone placed. It met the algo's criteria for either time frame, dollar amount, unusual because maybe that contract is never traded and now all of a sudden it is being traded. So it's hitting the scanner because of algo criteria, but it's actually a trade that someone else placed. So we're not creating information for you to follow or not. It's a trade that someone else placed that met the criteria for us to see it. So what we're watching across the screen all day, that's called the options flow. And we're watching the flow to get an idea of what the big money thinks of certain tickers. So I mentioned before that it is real time. All of this information on this particular graphic, this is within one second of the market opening. All of this, happened within one second, and the benefit of this particular scanner is that we saw it on our screen within that one second. It is expensive to have real-time data, but Blackbox wants you guys to be able to place trades on the best information available. And if you get your information delayed by 20 minutes, you're not getting the best information available. So you can see this information, and if it was a dollar when it came in on the scanner, now it's 20 minutes later, you're getting that information that someone placed a trade for a dollar, and you go to open that position, but now it's a dollar 40, you're missing out on a 40% gain just because the information you have, you can't act on it in real time. So Blackbox pays for that real time data, which is why we have a, a bit of an edge over some of the competition that also provides scanning services. There's a few advantages to black box. The first and most important is that we have real time data. There's no delay. When you see something on the scanner, that's when it executed on the exchange. So all of that and what we're looking for is options flow. So what is all of this? That's what we're here to learn today. I wanna point out what the flow is showing us, some of the things to watch out for, and then some examples of how we would use it. So let's start with what actually the scanner is showing us. On every piece of line that comes in, there's a lot of information here. All of this comes in with every piece. So as it's scrolling, 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 every one of those lines is telling us all of this information, which starts with the time the trade executed, the ticker, the contract expiration, the strike price, whether it was call or put. This line here is going to be the spot price of the underlying when this trade executed. So this 79.31 was the price of the underlying when this trade executed for a 79.50 put. So without looking away, we can tell whether this is in the money, out of the money, at the money. So this was trading for 79.31, the contract was 79.50. So this was the first contract out of the money. Another 20 cents and it's in the money. This line is important. This is telling us 556 contracts traded at 0.661. The AA means above the ask. And I'll get into that in a bit, but that is extremely important. Sweep, this will tell us either sweep or block. This number here is the dollar amount of the trade. And this 26 here, that's the IV on those contracts at the time this trade was placed. So you can see each line is telling us a lot of information. The color is actually giving us information about the open interest, and I'm gonna get to that next. The price and the number of contracts are shown and where in the spread it was traded. And that's extremely important. That's another advantage of black box is that we're gonna give you the full picture of the market because we have that spread information. 
and we're going to be able to show you opens and we're going to be able to show you closes. We're going to be able to show you when they write these positions, all because of that spread information. So important to understand what the scanner is actually showing us in the first place. So we have the time executed, the ticker, expiration, strike price, calls or puts, underlying at the time this executed, number of contracts, price paid per contract, where in the spread they traded, sweeps or blocks, the dollar amount of the trade, and the contract IV. And all of that is on every single piece of line that comes across the scanner. So what do the colors mean? This is the first thing we see about the flow. And this is why I start off with the colors. This is the most important part. The first thing we're going to capture our attention or not is the color of the flow. The color of the flow is giving us an indication of open interest. So there's three examples that we're going to have, white, yellow, or purple. The white just means open interest hasn't been met yet. The yellow means open interest has been exceeded in a single transaction. And the purple means open interest has been met, but it took multiple trades to do so. Let's see if... We can go back to that snap. 121, those were leaps. So here's an example. <clears throat> this is coming in yellow, this first one here. And this was 6,648 contracts traded. So what I know is that the open interest is less than 6,648. And I know that because 6,648 in a single trade took out the entire open interest. So open interest had to be less than 6,648. Now this one's 1,020 and it's also yellow. So I know that the open interest is less than 1,020 because in a single trade, 1,020 contracts was more than the current open interest. So the current open interest has to be less than 1,020. So the color is giving me the first indication of whether or not it's something we're gonna follow because the color is giving me the conviction of the trade. So if there's 3,000 contracts in open interest and someone comes in and places a trade for 300 contracts, that's not a super significant trade. But like this one, the open interest on this happened to be 1,005 and someone comes in and places a trade for 6,648, that is significant. So the color is really giving us an indication of conviction because there's only 1,005 contracts open right now and someone today just traded 6,648. So what does that tell you about whether they believe in this trade or not? It's not like, oh, I'm gonna put a few bucks into this, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. There's 1,005 contracts in open interest. Someone traded 6,648. They're pretty sure that they're gonna put, and this one was for $964,000, so if they're putting that much money into this particular trade, they're pretty sure that that trade's gonna work out for them. This one was 29,000 contracts. Again, the open interest was 1,000 and someone traded 29,000 contracts. So that's a significant trade. The yellow is tipping us off that in a single trade, the open interest has been exceeded. The purple means open interest has been met, but in this particular trade, it didn't exceed it in a single trade. So when we see this 262 come in, this one's purple. So at this point in the day, remember open interest was 1,005. This one took out the open interest because this was 6,000 traded. So at this point, open interest has been met for the day. This one's 262 contracts. That's not above 1,005. So it won't come in yellow because it's not above the open interest. 
but open interest for the day has been met. So even though this one's not exceeding open interest in this single trade, because it's purple, I know that the open interest of the day has been met previously up to this point with today's activity. So 940 contracts, that's less than 1,005. Again, on this particular contract, 1,005 is the open interest. And that's not shown on here, that's just from the options chain. But I know that we've traded at least 1,005 contracts if this comes in purple. 940 is less than 1,005, so it won't be yellow. But because it's purple, it tells me that the open interest for the day has been met. And we know that because of just these previous trades alone. So those are the colors, white, yellow, purple, and it means open interest. So white is open interest has not been met. Yellow, open interest has been met in a single trade. Purple, open interest has been met, but it took multiple trades to do so. And it's really the first thing that catches our attention. We don't really pay attention to the white flow because it's not super impactful. It's not something jumping out at us saying someone really believes in this trade. And again, going back to that snap example, if there are 1,005 contracts in open interest and someone places a trade for 150 contracts, it's not necessarily a significant trade. But if there are 1,005 contracts in open interest and someone places that trade for 6,000 contracts, that is significant. That's the type of stuff we're looking for. So the first thing we're going to notice is these colors. We're really looking for these whites, or the sorry, for the yellows and purples. We're not really paying attention to the white. If we see the white back to back to back, that is going to capture our attention because if contracts are traded throughout the day, at some point the open interest will have been met. So if open interest is 1,000 and someone places a trade for 200, then 200, then 200, then 200, we're at 800. So each of those trades would be white. Another trade comes in for 800. Now we're at 1,000. So if another trade comes in, the next one is going to be purple or yellow because open interest will have been met. So if we see five white trades for 200 contracts each coming in back to back to back, the reason it's not purple is because open interest hasn't been met yet. But if they continue to buy those contracts, at some point, open interest will have been met or exceeded. So that's going to go from white to purple. When we see flow coming in in white and then it turns to purple, that's a good sign because that shows someone's building up a position. When we see a lot of purple flow, that's telling me someone's building a position because the open interest has been met, but it was a little bit of a smaller trade here and there but open interest has been met and they're still buying more of those contracts. So sometimes someone is gonna try and hide their position. They don't wanna go in and buy 10,000 contracts of something because that's gonna set off a lot of alarms. Everyone's gonna see that. Whoa, here's a big trade. Someone just bought 10,000 contracts. So sometimes what they'll do is break up a big trade into smaller trades. I'm going to buy 200 here, 600 here, 500 here, 700, 400, 300, and eventually within 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to have 10,000 contracts. But I'm going to break it up and do it in 100, 300, $500 sections so that someone really doesn't see that I just took a large position of 10,000 contracts. Unfortunately for you, if you try to do that, Blackbox picks up all of those individual scans. So when we see that trade for 200 and then followed by 500 and then followed by 700, I can see that you're trying to build a large position even though you're not doing it in one transaction. So when I see these purple, 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 that's showing me that you're trying to build a large position. You're not doing it in one trade, so you're trying to break it up to maybe hide the intention of the trade. Or maybe you bought 500 contracts and then the you got either news or the, the ticker's moving in your direction, so you want to add to your position, you buy 300 more. And then maybe you buy 300 more because it's doing well. 
So I can see that you're building and building and building a position here, and that's going to be the purple coming in back to back. So before I move on, any questions on the colors? There's one, can you show an example of OI and flow together? So the best example would be that snap that I showed. So snap had 1,005 contracts in open interest and that first trade that came in for 6,000 contracts came in yellow because 6,000 was bigger than the 1,000 that was currently in open interest. And then the ones that you saw for 400 contracts or 600, whatever the number was on that snap example, those were purple because open interest has been met already. So they're going to be purple, but that one trade didn't exceed the 1,005. So that trade is going to be purple because the single trade was less than the 1,005, but 1,005 has been traded for the day already. So from that point forward, that particular contract traded will show up in purple. Jenny, I can add the heat map in a little bit. It's not something that's part of the traditional presentation, but I can absolutely throw that in there later on. The heat map has more to do, I'd say, with the spread than the colors. And the spread is next, so maybe I throw it in there coming up. But the colors pertain to open interest. White, open interest hasn't been met. Yellow, it's been met in a single trade. Purple, it's been met, but not in a single trade. So from that point forward, if that contract is traded, they will all be purple because open interest for the day has been met. So again, we like yellow and purple. Yellow is showing us conviction. There's a large single trade that took out OI. Purple is showing us repeated buying, which tells me there's a potentially large position being built. On to the spread, and this is the, I'd say, probably the most important thing to pay attention to. The colors are what's going to capture our attention, but the spread is something we really need to focus on because the spread's telling us where it filled in the bid ask spread. That's giving me an indication of whether these are opening or closing positions. That's really important to understand because if we're opening a position that someone else is closing, we're taking the opposite trade of them. Now, when we trade in the stock market, we're looking for high probability trades. So when someone puts their money into the market, the reason we're looking for this unusual activity is because we're gonna decide whether or not we wanna piggyback on their idea. So if someone puts $400,000 into the market, and we like the chart position, we like the fundamentals, we like the news, whatever type of trade you place. If we like what we see, and we know someone just put $400,000 into that specific contract, that might be something that we wanna follow. Now, if we're not paying attention to the spread and we're not realizing that they actually closed that position and we're opening that position, the trade can work for us but probability-wise, it probably won't because there's a reason they're pulling $400,000 out of a position. So if they're pulling 400 grand out and we're trying to open that position, we're basically buying what that trader is dumping out of. So can it work for us? Absolutely. Any trade is going to go up or down. The smart money doesn't know. We don't know. We can open a trade that someone just pulled a million dollars out of and we can make money. Probability though is against us. So the spread is really important to pay attention to. It's gonna give us an indication of whether these are opening or closing trades. In this column here, you're gonna see five things. <clears throat> you're gonna see AA, you're gonna see B, you're gonna see A, you're gonna see BB, or like this one, you're gonna see nothing in that column. So there's five things there. We're gonna see either nothing, BB, B, A, or AA. Nothing means we don't know where in the spread it traded. 
BB is below the bid, B is bid. A is ask, AA is above the ask. So it's telling us where in the spread these trades actually executed. That's really important for us to understand. So that's going to give us an indication of whether these are opening or closing positions. That's going to give us an indication of whether these are being written. There is such a thing as bullish put activity. There is such a thing as bearish call activity. And the spread is what's going to give us that information. So if you guys are brand new to trading, here's a really quick example of the spread. The bid ask spread, let's say it's a dollar by a dollar fifty. If you're trying to open that position with a market order, you're going to get filled at a dollar fifty, maybe a dollar forty five, maybe a dollar forty. You're not going to get filled at a dollar because the spread is a dollar by a dollar fifty, and you're trying to open that position, you're not going to get the best price of a dollar. You're going to get filled closer to a dollar fifty. On the flip side, if you're trying to close that position, and the spread is a dollar by a dollar fifty, and you do a market order, you're not getting a dollar fifty. It is possible, but it's very unlikely. So if the spread is a dollar by a dollar fifty, and you get filled at a dollar with pretty much ninety nine percent certainty, I know that you closed that position. It's very unlikely that with a dollar by a dollar fifty spread, you get filled at a dollar, you were opening that position. So the spread is giving me an indication of where these trades are being executed, whether it's opening or closing or writing, and whether it's bullish or bearish. BB and AA is below the bid and above the ask. That's showing me an urgency to get into or out of these positions. So that's important for me to see. Above the ask means you're paying more than you have to for this position. Below the bid means you're taking less than you could for that position. So that's an urgency to get out of a position. If the spread is a dollar by a dollar fifty and you tell your broker, I'm okay getting 90 cents. You're pretty much telling the broker, I don't care what I get filled, just get me out of this position. On the flip side, if the spread is a dollar by a dollar fifty, and you tell your broker, I'm okay paying a dollar sixty-five, what you're saying there is, I don't care how much I pay, just get me into the position. I'll pay more than I need to pay. If the market is asking a dollar fifty, and I'm paying a dollar sixty or a dollar sixty-five, and I'm okay with that, that's telling me an urgency to get into the position into the position. I don't care what I pay, just get me in. So above the ask and below the bid are showing me urgency to open and close these positions. Any questions on the spread? I'm going to show you an example of why call activity can be bearish. But before I do that, I want to make sure you guys understand what the spread is showing us. Any questions on the spread? I don't see any questions on the spread, so we are going to move on. So below the bid, bid, ask, above ask. If there's no indication there, it just means it filled between the bid and the ask. In that case, we're not going to sit there and try and decipher whether it's bullish or bearish. We're just going to move on from that particular flow. So if there's no indication there, it just means it got filled between the bid and the ask. So that's basically what the scanner is showing us. And all of that information is coming at us in real time, so it can be confusing. It can be very fast moving. What we really want to know is how do we use this information? As long as we understand what it's showing us, can I get people in the flow class that a day later, two days later, send me flow and say, hey, is this bullish or bearish? So I know that people have taken the class and still have questions on what we covered in the class. So it's definitely some confusing information. If you're new to options, it's really confusing when I say calls can be bearish. The calls themselves aren't bearish, but the activity around the calls can be bearish. 
And that's confusing to a lot of new traders because they're like, wait a minute, you buy calls when you think something's going to go up in value. So why are you telling me there's call activity that's bearish? So it's definitely confusing. I know people that have been on the scanner for two months, three months, and they send me questions that I know are basic questions, which it tells me they get what the scanner's doing, but they don't really understand how to use it. They don't understand what it's really telling us. So I can tell you that yellow means open interest has been exceeded in a single transaction. Your first step of learning is to be able to recite that back to me. I say, hey, what does yellow mean? And you say, yellow means open interest has been exceeded in a single transaction. So that's great. The first level of learning is right there. You understand that what I've said is committed to memory and you can recite that back to me. I say, this is the definition. You repeat the definition. So stage one of learning is to understand what the scanner is showing us. The next step though is to really understand it. And if you're in our Discord chat room, I'll put out examples of random quizzes and say, hey guys, what was this particular trade? And a lot of people will get it right, which is comforting. That means a lot of people are really understanding because when I do a quiz, it's not just what's the definition of yellow. I'll put it up something that you really have to understand what it means to be able to answer the question. So it's comforting when people can answer it. But there's a lot of people that don't know the answer. And the reason for that is they understand what the scanner is telling us, but they don't fully grasp the, what it actually means. So I'm going to have a Q&A session at the end of this. If you have any questions on anything, please, please, please speak up. So hopefully everything's clear so far, as far as the main things we're looking for are the color and the spread. So there's really only two things. The color is gonna basically grab our attention right away. And the spread is gonna tell me whether these are opening, closing, or writing trades. So now that I see what the scanner is showing us, the big question is how do we actually use the information? A lot of what you see on the scanner is what this graphic shows here. It's just mixed information. Since it's all real-time activity, it's not organized in a way that all of the BABA trades are here, all of the Gilead trades are here. If you see this particular screen, we have Twitter, Verizon, BABA, Oracle. As the trades are executed, they come across the scanner. So it's not organized in any particular ticker. It's not organized in calls versus puts. You can use filters to only show calls or puts, but in general, it's just giving us all of the trades. So what we see on the screen right here, there's nothing in there that I'm gonna place a trade on. That Twitter being yellow might capture my attention. I might pull up Twitter and look at the rest of the flow, but the majority of the day, this is what we see. It's just random tickers coming across our screen. There's nothing there that's really sticking out that's gonna be a high probability trade. Now, if we saw, so that Twitter is yellow, if we saw a bunch of those come in, this is just one screenshot. So obviously if we saw a bunch of those coming in or the BABA or the Oracle that's on there, if we saw that repeated back to back to back, that's gonna capture our attention. But the screen grab right there, there's nothing there that's just sticking out except for that Twitter. But again, that's not, that's $27,000 worth. That in and of itself isn't really a whole lot that's gonna grab my attention. It's the start but there's nothing there that's really screaming at me saying, holy crap, you've got to pull up this ticker. So the majority of the day, that's what we see. It's just mixed flow. There's nothing in there that's a high probability trade for me. I wanna make a note on ETFs. We typically do not follow the ETF flow. The reason we don't follow ETF flow, let's say you see a bunch of cues come in, puts, Someone put a million dollars into Q puts. Wow, million dollars, that's a big position. If that person has a $45 million tech heavy contract or portfolio, and they put a million dollars into a particular Q put contract, what does that tell us? They think the Qs are gonna drop, so we should follow that trade, hoping the Qs drop. It could be, a million dollar put position, that's basically a hedge against a 35, 40, $50 million tech heavy position. 
So if the, if tech drops, their portfolio is going to take a hit, but that million dollar Q put position is going to gain in value. So it's going to offset some of their loss. So a lot of the ETFs can be a hedge. On this particular graphic, if you look at that, that is $1.8 million of SPY contracts. If you look at the average amount of money that flows into SPY, $1.8 million is nothing. If you add all of those up, that's 2,800 contracts. I am not going into the market and placing 2,800 contract SPY trades. That's a huge trade for me. So huge that I would never do that. I am not trading 2,800 contracts. That is a huge trade for me. However, if you think of the volume for SPY of 70 million on average, 2,800 contracts is nothing. So when we see 2,800 contracts back to back to back, SPY call, SPY call, SPY call, it's still not going to capture my attention because it's insignificant compared to what SPY actually trades on average. So we typically don't follow ETF flow because one, the numbers might not really be significant, and two, it might be a hedge against another position. So the ETF flow is sometimes hard to follow. We will follow it here and there, but it has to be something extraordinary that really sticks out. So if you trade SPY all the time and you see some SPY calls come in, don't necessarily place your trade based on that. We don't always follow the ETF flow. And here's the important part, bearish call activity. One of the advantages of black box over the competition is that we show you the full market. We show you when people are entering and exiting trades. We show you when these trades are being written. So bearish calls, what am I talking about? I thought calls were bullish. If something's going to go up in value, I buy a call contract. And you would be correct. Calls are not bearish. Calls are bullish. But there's bearish activity around calls. Two reasons. Let's say I have 100 contracts of BABA calls. And I close out 200 of them. I have 1,000 contracts. I close out 200. Then I close out another 200. Then I close out another 200. And you see that I have 1,000 contracts and I'm slowly unwinding my position. Is that bullish or bearish? That's bearish because I'm unwinding my call position. Now, if the scanner picks up that trade, it's going to show me calls on the screen because I'm closing out calls. So it's going to show me the call position, but it's going to show bid side, if you look here, these are Bs, that means bid. Calls being filled on the bid mean I'm closing out that position. So if you see this activity on your screen, call, 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 same strike, same expiration, and you open that position not paying attention to the bid, you're buying what this trader is closing. It can work for you, but it's a lower probability trade. So call activity can be bearish if someone's closing out a previously opened call position. The other reason is if I'm writing a call position. And if you're new to options, close your ears for a few seconds because this will confuse you. If you understand what writing means, if I'm writing a call position, that's a bearish scenario. So if I'm writing a call position, that's going to show up on the scanner bid side. So when I see calls coming in on the bid, there's two reasons why it can be bearish, and that's closing out a previously open position or someone writing those calls. We'll see that activity on the scanner as calls because that's the contract being traded. It's going to come across bid side, though. That's how we know they're closing or writing. So it's really important to see that bid side activity. You don't want to buy a position that someone else is closing out of. And if we're trading on probability, if someone just pulls $80,000 out of a specific contract, the probability of that contract working out is just lower. Because if it would have worked out, they wouldn't have closed it out. Right? If I have 1,000 calls for, in this case, this is SNAP. 
$18 calls expired October of last year. So if I bought a bunch of snap calls for $18 that expired back in October, and we're getting closer to October, if I think snap is gonna continue to increase in value, would I close out that position? No. So when I close out a call position, that's bearish activity. Because obviously I don't think the underlying is gonna to continue to increase in value. If I'm writing a call position, same thing. I want the person who buys those calls to lose money and that happens if the underlying drops. So two reasons call activity can be bearish. If I'm closing out a previously open position or if I'm writing. And we know that because over here in this column, we're gonna see bid side activity. So calls on the bid, bearish activity. Puts, same thing, for the same reason. If I'm closing a put position, the underlying I would expect to increase in value. So put positions can be bullish by closing out that put position or from writing a put position. That means I want the underlying to increase in value. So when we see bid side activity, it's closing a position or someone writing 99% of the time. The reason I say 99% is because if the bid ask spread is moving quickly and you execute an order as the bid ask spread jumps, you can get filled on the bid or ask by opening or closing. So if I'm buying, I'm opening a position for calls and the spread is a dollar by a dollar 15. and I get filled at a dollar, the lower side, it could mean the bid ask spread just jumped as I got executed. And the bid is now the ask or the ask is now the bid. So we say 99% of the time, because if the bid ask spread is moving as we execute, you can get the best fill possible. But 99% of the time, if we see put activity coming in bid side, like this graphic shows, that's someone closing out of that position or writing the position. Your default settings do not show that because it can be confusing. So the default settings say, if you see calls, it's bullish. If you see puts, it's bearish. So go to your filter section over here, above ask only and at or above ask are checked by default. If you want to see that bid side activity, you have to uncheck those two settings. By default, you will not see bid side activity. A few examples of the flow we're looking for. This is MU, expired 816, $49 calls. All the same strike, all the same expiration. It's just coming in back to back to back to back to back. When you see flow like this, it's going to grab your attention because you can't help but not see it. It's on your screen, it's in front of your face, it's there, you're going to see it. It sticks out, it's telling us a story. Pristine flow, same thing. Look at this, this is all target. You can see here it started white and then it turned purple. That means the open interest hasn't been met. It hasn't been met. It hasn't been met. It hasn't been met. At this point, open interest has been exceeded. Not in a single trade. It took all of this to do so. This is showing me that someone's building a position, building a position, building a position, building, building, building. They keep adding to this position. They're doing it 150, 250, 250, 221, 250, 172 at a time, but they're building a large position. An example of sneaky whites. I said before, we don't always follow the white flow. When you see it like this, it's going to grab our attention because it's coming in really quick. These four pieces right here happened within less than a minute or about a minute. So when we see it coming in this quickly, one, two, three, four, within a minute's time, it's telling me there's some activity going on in that particular contract. If activity continues in that contract, I would expect open interest at some point to be met and then exceeded. So we don't pay attention to the whites, but if we see the white flow coming in back to back to back in a really quick time frame, if they keep trading that at some point, open interest will be exceeded. So when we see it go from white to purple like that, that's the white flow that will capture our attention. And we say it's sneaky because we typically don't follow the white flow. Rapid fire is when something comes in within a really quick time frame. 
boom, 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 boom. It's just back to back to back. It's hit, it's hit, it's hit. This is Nike. These are older graphics. So this expired 823. This was an 8250 call. It's the same strike, same expiration. 104150, 104348. So this is a little bit less than two minutes. All of this comes in. Boom, 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 boom. You can't help but notice this kind of flow. That's the type of stuff that we're looking for. That's the type of stuff we want to follow. Because this is telling us within a two minute window, this is two seconds less than two minutes. So one minute. 58 seconds, all of this came in. Within that two minutes, someone really just pounded this contract and built a large position really quickly. That's what we want to know. Why is someone really urgently trying to build a large position? They know something. That's the type of flow we're looking for when we say unusual options activity. This is unusual because within two minutes, someone just pounded this contract. So this is 2,455 contracts in two minutes. It took eight trades to do so, but within eight trades, just boom, 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 boom. They just built up almost 2,500 contracts. Why do they want 2,500 contracts within two minutes? There's an urgency to get into this trade. That's the type of flow we're looking for. That's unusual. Really quickly, they're building a large position. That's unusual. That's the reason we like this information. We see them doing that. That's the type of stuff we want to follow. When I said before, the bid side activity shows when someone's exiting a position. This is a trade the room took. This is Macy's. This was on a Friday. We saw all of this activity on a Friday coming in ask side, sweeps. There's an above the ask. We followed this particular trade. This was 531. This was a Friday. 63 was Monday. We saw the same contract. Now you see it trading on the bid. So we know that this trader opened the position Friday. These are all ask side. Come Monday, we see the same contract bid side. We know they're closing out of their position. Now that doesn't mean we have to close our position, but if we know we follow them in and they're pulling their money out, it's a good indication for us to look at something and say, maybe I want to pull my money out too. If you look at this graphic, these started at 43 and 44 cents. They closed them at 88 cents. So over the weekend, they made a 100% gain on that trade. Is that a good reason to pull your money out of the trade? Absolutely. So we follow them into the trade Friday. We see those contracts being flipped out of Monday. That's going to give us an indication if we're not looking at this particular ticker and I see that, ooh, I'm in that contract and this trader just flipped out of it. Let me pull up the chart, see what's going on. So we can see when these buyers are exiting. The competition doesn't show you that. They'll show you the bottom portion. They might show a 20 minute delayed, but they'll show you if there's activity like this. And one of the things we've noticed, we've had members that have had multiple scanners. And when we see activity like this, where there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there's nine pieces of flow on this graphic. They'll talk to us and say, hey, I'm on this particular scanner. You guys are showing nine pieces of flow. They only showed three pieces. Why? What's the difference? The difference is our scanner is just more comprehensive. It picks up more of the picture. If you see three pieces of flow, is that something you're going to follow? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not, because there's not a lot of conviction there. If you see the same contract, but now you're seeing nine pieces of flow, that's much more conviction. So our scanner picks up more information. We filter out a lot of the nonsense you don't need to see, but it picks up more of the information that you do need to see. So we see this information come in. We see that the trader exited the position. The competition will show you the entry but they don't show you when the competition or when the trader flipped out of the position. That's one of the benefits of black box stocks. So what are we looking for? Time frame, really short time frame, like that two minute window or pounded all day long. If someone's buying at 9 30, 10, 11 30, 12, 1, 2, 2 15, the entire day they're just buying this particular contract. That's a good sign. 
same strike, same expiration is giving us consistency. They're not guessing. Last week when you saw Tesla, there were Tesla 1,000 calls, Tesla 300 puts, Tesla 600, Tesla 400 calls, puts, near term, long term. They were all over the place. No one knew what Tesla was going to do. That kind of flow isn't going to give me anything to follow. Same strike, same expiration is a consistency. There's a story. The story is by this date, I think this price will reach. Or if not, that price will reach, that direction will go. So same strike, same expiration is a consistency we're looking for. Contract price increasing, we like to see that. Back to that earlier example, if the contract started at a dollar and then they hit a dollar fifty, that's a fifty percent gain. But with a fifty percent gain, if they're not closing out that position, they're adding more to it. That's a good sign. We like to see ask and above ask and sweeps. Again, that's showing the urgency to open the position. I don't care if I pay more than I need to pay, just get me into the position. So that checklist, that's what we're looking for. Now, if everything on that checklist is checked, it doesn't mean it's going to be a prob uh, profitable trade. The probability is that it's going to be profitable, but it doesn't guarantee it. All of those items can be checked and you can lose money. None of those items can be checked and you can make money. But as traders, we're looking for probability. The probability of something being profitable has those characteristics. Pounded all day or short time frame. Same strike, same expiration, contract price increasing, ask or above ask, and sweeps. When it has all of that, it's just a higher probability of success. If you can't sit and watch Flow all day, join our private Twitter accounts. At blackbox underscore team is algo generated alerts. Those algos are scanning the scanner and it's looking for those same strike, same expiration trades. It's looking for those short time frame trades. If you can't watch the flow, the Twitter alerts. They're the alerts from Blackbox. They're the same alerts, but they're alerting the stuff that we're looking for if you couldn't watch the scanner all day long. So when I'm saying I'm looking for same strike, same expiration, I'm looking for this five minute, 10 minute window. I'm looking for ask and above ask sweeps. I'm looking for contract price increasing. We have an algo that scans the scanner. And when it finds that specific set of criteria, it spits out an alert. If you can't watch the flow, the Twitter alerts are the alerts on the flow that meet that checklist criteria. You do have to join them. It is a private account. Send a DM to the account with your black box name. So follow at blackbox underscore team and then send a DM to that account and say, hey, my black box name is, and they will get you approved for that account. A few things I'm going to race through real quick. There are different types of alerts. They are algo driven. They do not consider technical analysis, news, or market conditions. Please, please, please trade accordingly. Roulettes mean it's a same week expiration trade. So if you're not comfortable with volatility or short term trading, do not follow the roulette alerts. Same thing, if you find a leap alert and you're a short term trader, do not follow the leap alert. The alerts don't say buy me. The alerts just say something unusual happened. Pull up the chart, pull up the flow, see if you agree with what that trader did. So know the type of trader you are. You don't wanna follow a roulette alert if you're not comfortable with short term trading. When you get good at watching the flow, you'll be able to see what's going to alert potentially before it happens. So I'm on West Coast time. So this is 9.49. Charlie, SLB puts coming in, starting to see action. 10.02, we got the alert. 9.49, keep an eye on Oracle, starting to build up. We need another one. 10 minutes later, we got that other one and it alerted. So when you see the flow repeatedly, if it's confusing now with seat time, you'll be able to see the flow come in and kind of get an idea of what might alert. Now, the reason it didn't alert 
is because the criteria hasn't been met yet. But the way it comes in, we see how it's coming in and we know that if more of this activity happens the way it's been happening, it will alert. So if it's confusing now with seat time, you'll be able to see what's going to potentially alert before it actually alerts, because you'll get an eye for what we're looking for. Here's how you trade with an alert system. I like this example because it's not a great trade. We have an alert at 10.02. At 10.03, I entered this particular trade. This was a put, so I was making money here. It turned against me. I was making money here. At this point, I was up 27%. It turned against me. I didn't like what was going on with the market conditions, so I closed it for a 13% gain. Now, it was up at 27% at one point. I closed it for 13%. We don't trade for 13% gains, but this was a put. This is where it was towards the end of the day. So I exited here for 13%. If I let it go way up here, this would have been a red trade. So the reason I point this out is because you have to manage the alerts. If you follow an alert and you get into a particular trade, it doesn't mean it's just gonna go and make money for you. This one was up 27%. I closed it for 13%. If I didn't close it, it would have been negative percent. I would have lost money. So I put this slide on there because it shows that you can be up a, a decent amount and then you can go from that to being down. So you have to manage these alerts. Do they work? Here's one I entered 24 seconds after the alert. I exited 27 minutes later with a 30% gain. So again, if your scanner is 20 minutes delayed, I exited this trade 27 minutes after the alert for 30%. So if I didn't get this information for 20 minutes, there wouldn't have been a trade there. Here's one for 42%. If that's not good enough, here's one for 100%, just following the alerts. So the alerts do work if you know what to look for. I wanna point out you should trade your style. Trading is hard. Do not take trades that go against your personality. So again, a roulette alert expires this week. If you're not comfortable with that short-term volatility, don't take that trade. Even if the flow looks great, don't take the trade if it's against your personality. If it turns against you, you're just gonna be sitting there going, you know what, oh, I knew I shouldn't have taken that trade. Why did I follow that? It's not the type of trade I normally take. Why did I follow that? And you're not gonna feel good. On top of that, you're gonna be shaking a little bit, or you're gonna be uncomfortable trading. And if you're uncomfortable trading, you're not going to be successful. So don't take trades that go against your personality. Let's pick a random ticker here. Hopefully, Facebook. And I don't know if this is gonna be a good or a bad example, I'm just randomly picking a ticker. If you click down here on the heat map, so here we've got calls, we've got puts, we've got bid, we've got ask, we've got above ask and below the bid. So it's a little confusing, there's a lot in here. If we click on the heat map, what it's gonna do is give us a visual representation of the flow. Now, if I see this, I instantly see that it's predominantly bearish. There's a lot of bullish activity, but there's more on the bearish side. And the reason I know this is the green and the red. Green is bullish, red is bearish. So this is the call side. C0 means this is the current week. P0, this is the current week for puts. C1, this is call flow activity that's coming across the scanner today for next week out. P1, this is put activity for next week out. C2 and P2 is call and put activity for two weeks and further dated. And all I'm looking for, this is really simple. All I'm looking for is green or red. It doesn't matter what side it's on. So this is red, that's bearish activity. This is green, that's bullish activity. These are calls. So how is calls bearish activity? Someone closing out of the position or writing the position? These are puts. We have bullish activity and bearish. 
So all we're focused on for the heat map is really just red or green. Doesn't matter what side it's on. If this whole thing was red, that's really bearish activity. Doesn't mean if it's calls or puts, doesn't matter. It's really bearish activity. If we have this where we have green and red mixed together, it's just mixed flow. So it's hard to tell what the big money thinks of this particular ticker. Some thinks it's bullish, some thinks it's bearish. AMD, same thing. It's mixed. There's red, there's green. There's red, there's green. So it's just mixed. It's hard to tell a direction because there's so much activity going on. I'm going to try and find one where there's a clear direction. Not going to spend too much time on it if I can't find one or two. Bad example, but it tells exactly what we're looking for. So this is all the flow for Yelp today. If you scroll through, there's only two green boxes, and it's for C2. So this means calls that are dated two weeks or further out are bullish because these are green. If these were red, it doesn't matter that it's on the call side. If they're red, it's bearish. So because these are green, for two weeks or further dated, Yelp activity for today that came across the scanner is bullish. There's two strikes, 39 and 40. They're two weeks or further, and they're both bullish positions. So that's the heat map. It's a really quick visual representation of the flow. So if you see the flow and there's calls, there's puts, there's bid, there's ask, and you're not sure what's going on, pull up the heat map, and it's gonna give you a quick visual representation of bullish or bearish. And all you're looking for, don't get confused with the call side and the put side. All you're looking for with the heat map is red or green. Red is bearish, green is bullish. Doesn't matter what side it's on. So are there any questions on flow, how we use the scanner? I'm gonna give you guys a few tips and then we're gonna wrap this up. If you want to see the performance of the alerts, Go to my personal Twitter account. This isn't the company page. This is my personal account, at 7 Star Mike. I put the stats for these alerts up there. This blue portion here is the percentage gain for the same day the alert came out. This pink portion is the percentage gain if you held throughout the week, whatever the weekly high was. These are the gains that we saw, same day gains for last week. 118%, 216%, 394, 303, 598% same day gain. Now, these were the weeks we had Tesla alerts. 1000%, 6800% gain, 3900% gain. These were just alerts that came out last week. This is the performance of them. This is how many gave 15 to 25% gain, how many gave 25 to 50%. So you can see we had 57 alerts, 29 had a 15 to 25% gain, four of them had over 100% gain. So if you go to 7 Star Mike on Twitter, scroll down, you'll see a few posts like this. Those are the stats for the alerts. Now, I want to give you guys a few tips and then we're going to wrap this up. The first tip, if we have a super green day, do not follow the bearish alerts. Sometimes they will pinpoint the peak and valley and call the reversal. The majority of the time, if we see a lot of, or not even a lot, if we just see any kind of put activity on a super green day, those are typically the alerts that don't work well. On a super red day, when you see green alerts coming in, those call alerts are typically not going to work well. Again, sometimes they will actually pinpoint the reversal. A lot of times, however, on a super green day, the puts are the worst performers. On a super red day, the calls are the worst performers. So that's tip number one. Tip number two, people say, well, how many, all these alerts come in, how many should I follow? 
And my tip for that is follow the alerts that make sense. Well, what makes sense? There's Yesterday was a huge alert day. We had something like 40 alerts. What makes sense? I will not follow an Amazon alert where the contract is $4,000, $5,000, I'm not doing that. I'm not putting $6,000 into a single Amazon contract. Tesla, $800, $900 contract. I'm probably not doing that one. So you see this one right here. Tesla just came across the screen for $13.90 for a contract. Now, this isn't an alert. This is just flow. But assuming that was an alert that alerted at $13.90, I am not following that. I'm not putting $1,400 into a single Tesla contract. I don't like Tesla. Tesla has burned me many times. Tesla is almost on my do not trade list. I will trade Amazon and Tesla usually Thursdays and Fridays when those contracts are cheaper and when the movement can be drastic. So Tesla, until it's a Friday, sometimes Thursday, I'm typically not trading Tesla. So if we were to get an alert on a Monday or Tuesday for $1,400 per contract, I'm just not touching that one. I like short-term trading. So if we get an alert for six months down the road, I am not taking that trade. I don't care how good the flow looks. Unless the chart is perfect and the flow is perfect, I do have typically one swing position open at a time, sometimes two, depending on the setup that I see. So if I don't have an open swing trade and there's something that's perfect setup and the flow comes in and we get an alert for six months down the road and I love the chart, it was something I was looking at, I might take that trade. Typically, if I have one open swing trade, sometimes two open swing trades, and we get perfect alert, perfect flow for six months down the road, I'm not taking it because swinging isn't my preferred method of trading. So tip number two, trade your style. If you get alerts that are roulette alerts and you like that short-term trading and you like the volatility, trade those alerts. If you don't like that short-term volatility, don't trade those alerts. So narrow it down by price, narrow it down by time frame, narrow it down by the ticker. I'm not going to take an Amazon alert unless it's if it's a Thursday or Friday and those contracts are three, four, five hundred bucks. And I know that on a Thursday or Friday, those $400 contracts can turn into $1,600. I might take that one. If it's a Monday and it's $1,400 for a single contract, I'm probably not. So narrow down by price, narrow down by time frame, narrow down by ticker. There's a question on there, do you provide stop loss alerts? We do not. These alerts are not buy alerts. They don't mean this alert came out, buy it. They mean something unusual is happening. Take a look at it, see if you agree with it. So there are no alerts on when to get out of a trade because there are no alerts to get into a trade. You decide to take the alert. If you take the alert, that is your trade. Just because a big money trader put $600,000 into a trade doesn't mean you have to take it. If you do take it, doesn't mean you have to wait for them to exit. Once you hit the buy button, that is your trade. Now, if you're in the chat room or if you're not a part of Black Box Stocks and if you're following me on Twitter, you can send a message and say, hey, I saw you guys posting about this or I'm part of Black Box on Discord. Hey, there's an alert for this. What do you guys think of the levels? So do you see support here? Do you see resistance here? We can do that for you, but we don't know your account size. We don't know your risk tolerance. So a perfect example, if someone buys an Amazon contract, let's say they buy five contracts, they put 10 grand into an Amazon trade, and you like the trade, you like the alert, and you want to follow that trader, and you buy one contract. So let's say you have $2,000 into that contract. Let's say it's $2,000 per contract. The big money trader, let's say they bought five, so they have 10,000. And now those contracts are down 50%. You lost $1,000. If your account was 5,000 and you just lost 1,000, you're probably sweating. And you're asking that other trader, hey man, this is down 50%, what, what are we doing with this? And that trader's going, oh, it's okay. And you're going, oh man, it, it's, it's not okay. I only had $5,000 and I, I bought one contract. I'm down 1,000 already. I'm, I don't know, man, I, I can't hang in this much longer. What's going on? And the other trader just constantly says, you know, it's okay. It's not at support or it's not at resistance. I'm okay with it. And then it goes down 75%. You've lost a lot of money. And that other trader says, okay, you know what, guys? This isn't working out. I'm going to cut it here. 
and you're going, crap, I just lost so much money. Why didn't you cut that sooner? And the other trader is saying, oh, I have $300,000 account. I just put 10,000 into that trade. It didn't work out, no big deal. I just lost $7,500. I have a $3 million account. 7,500 is nothing. I was gonna risk most of that to see if I could get the move. And you're going, oh man, I didn't know that. I only had 5,000 and lost 750. I lost 1750. I lost 1400, whatever the numbers are, you don't know the risk tolerance or the account size of the person that opened that trade. So they might open a trade and say, I'm comfortable if this goes to zero and you're following them and it's working against you and you're going, oh man, I'm losing money. I can't afford to let this go to zero. And they're saying, oh, I'm gonna stick with it. And yeah, you know, I'm not really gonna get rid of it just yet. You don't know that their risk tolerance is that if they lose 100%, it doesn't impact their portfolio where it might destroy yours. So a lot of times when you follow a trader into a trade, we don't know their account size, we don't know their risk tolerance, we don't know their intentions of the trade. So we don't like to say, I'm out here, you should get out. Because you might have more risk tolerance than me. I'm a short-term trader, so I might get out of trades early, locking in a particular gain because I see a resistance, I see a rejection, I'm not willing to let it reject further. Where someone else is a day trader, they're gonna let it reject a little bit further and then see if it bounces back. So I might get out early if you followed me and then it goes up another $3 and you're like, hey man, wow, you got out pretty early, what happened? Well, for me, it hit a target level and got rejected. And it was intended to be a very short-term scalp. So it did what I wanted it to do. It reached a level I was looking forward to reach and it got rejected there, target met, I'm out of the trade. And you're thinking, well, we could have captured more. Yeah, but my intentions were short-term scalp. Really, scalps are short term, really short, three minutes, two minutes, seven minutes. So I'm looking for levels to reject. And if it does that, I'm out of the trade where someone else might hold it all day long and capture a bigger piece of the, the puzzle, bigger piece of the prize. Because their intentions are to day trade it. Mine were to scalp. So my risk levels are gonna be different. The target levels I'm looking for might be different. So it's hard to follow someone into a trade and know exactly what you're gonna do based on what they're gonna do because the, the situations aren't the same. Having said all that, do we have any questions on flow or how we use the scanner or what the scanner is showing us? There's a question coming in. Looks like I only see half of the question. So far the question says, I had a question on a put. Let's say Monday I do a put on Amazon at $500. Cost is $7 for that week. Is there a question in there? Is there a second half to that? Am I not reading it correctly? Okay, next part. Same Amazon put for 500 on the third day, the cost is $2. So you're in Monday at $7. Three days later, the cost is now $2. Why is there a difference in the cost? Well, Amazon might have gone up in value. So if Amazon's going up, the price of those puts is gonna go down. Plus, because they're options, there's time decay. So as time goes on, options are going to decrease in value just based on time decay. So if I buy something that's $100 and I buy a $2 contract and it's a month out, if three, or three weeks go by and the underlying is still $100, my $2 contracts are probably gonna be 75 cents or so because the underlying is the exact same price, but three weeks have gone by. So even though the underlying hasn't gone up or down, the contracts are gonna go down drastically because time is going by. The time goes by means you have less time to make that contract in the money. So as more time goes by, those contracts are gonna lose value. And that's just part of options trading. The options have a limited time to them. So as you get closer to expiration, 
especially if they move against you, they're going to cost or they're, the value is going to be less. So if you buy an Amazon contract on Monday for $7 and Wednesday it's $2, it's because time has gone by and Amazon has likely moved against you. So if you bought a put, Amazon went up. So those put values are going to drop drastically because Amazon can move really quickly. That's why I don't trade Amazon and Tesla until Thursdays and Fridays because Amazon and Tesla are known to rip your face off. You can be in it, you can be up 20, 30%. Three candles later, you're down 40%. They just, they're very volatile. Amazon can move 20 bucks in a three, four, five minute time span. So those contracts, that's why we trade Amazon and Tesla on Friday, because you can buy an Amazon contract on Friday for let's say we buy the same, same day expiration. So let's say we buy a contract for $1.20 and it expires that same day, if that Amazon is moving in the direction of those contracts, we buy it for $1.20, those contracts can be six, seven, eight dollars in you know 30 minutes. They can be that in seven minutes. And the reason for that is because it's expiring that day. So as we get closer and closer to expiration, as those contracts move in one direction or another, they're going to gain or lose value very quickly. So if you buy a put on Monday and on Wednesday, it's worth a lot less. It's because time has gone by and the underlying has likely moved against the direction of your particular trade. There's another question on sold calls. When in short covering, there could be A and AA indicating people want to get out fast. Yes. Who buys a three DTE call for 30 bucks? Depends. So a lot of those, if it's 30 bucks, I don't know the, the ticker you're talking about, but a lot of those, if it's $30, I'm gonna assume that it's a contract that is very far in the money. So if it's a three DTE with $30 for the contract, that I'm going to basically assume is a stock replacement. And it just means that they're willing to own the stock at that price, but they don't want to outlay the, that amount of money. If it's Tesla, well, if it's Tesla, that's a completely different story. So Tesla right now, those contracts are just, I mean, they are 30, 40 bucks because of the volatility. So that 30 or $40 contract on Tesla can be 60 or $70, even though it's only three days away that 30 or 40 dollar contract can be 60 or 70 dollars today so because it's tesla and because tesla is just nuts right now those contracts are super juiced those contracts will not normally be 30 or 40 bucks if it's at the money those contracts are very expensive right now however those contracts because it's tesla if tesla moves 30 bucks a contract that costs 30 bucks can be you know 120 bucks in an hour and a half or so. So because it's Tesla, it's just expensive right now because Tesla's going nuts. But assuming it wasn't Tesla, so let's say we have Microsoft. And I don't know. So I have I have Yelp on the screen right now just because that's the last one we were looking at. So Yelp right now is trading at $34.72. And let's say you see a bunch of calls come in for $28 strike. That's really far in the money. So it's trading for $34.72, calls come in for $28. When we see it that far in the money, it's typically a stock replacement. So they want to own Yelp stock, but they don't want to pay $34.72 times however many shares they want. So they're going to buy right now the contracts. So let's say they want 300 shares, they're going to buy three contracts, which represents 300 shares. Instead of paying the 3474 times 300 they can buy the three contracts for uh, probably i don't know let's say they pay a thousand dollars for the contracts versus ten thousand dollars for the stock so when it's that far in the money sometimes that's a stock replacement ronald a is ask aa is above the ask 
go back and watch the seminar after hours or whenever you get a chance. There's a, a portion that goes over the spread, which is really, really, really important to understand. That's a big part of the presentation. There's two main things we look at is the open interest and the spread. So definitely go back and watch that portion of the, the spread portion. It's really important because that's giving us an indication of whether these are opening or closing trades. It's giving us an indication of whether these are people writing the contracts. So we don't wanna buy something that someone else is dumping out of. And the spread is gonna give us an indication of that. So definitely go back and check that out. That's probably, I'd say, the most important part of the presentation. I say there's two main parts is the spread and the open interest. The spread is probably the more important part of the two. Yes, this will be available outside of this meeting. It usually takes an hour, two hours, sometimes three hours to process the recording. Sometimes the recordings don't go through cleanly. It is being recorded. So what I would do is check back either at the end of the day, maybe give it at least two or three hours and then check back the email you got where you registered for it, if you click on that, it should bring you back to the presentation. If you try it right after we end the presentation, it will not be there. It sometimes does take two or three hours to be available. But if you go to your email, registration email, and you click on that link, it should bring you back to the replay. Jenny, the bootcamp doesn't necessarily go over the same information. The bootcamp is more about It'll go over some of the same information, but not the way I presented it here, not in the detail that I go through. The bootcamp is gonna go over basic trading, basic concepts, the platform, how to place a trade, how to buy, how to sell. It's gonna go over the scanner, what the scanner can show you, what the scanner can do for you. So it goes over a lot of that. It doesn't specifically focus on options. He does, I believe, touch upon options and she'll basically show about what the scanner is doing. But I don't think he goes into the detail of options specifically the way I do here. That's kind of why we do a, a separate options class is because I really want to focus on making sure people know that the bid and the ask is important and that the scanner shows it. So the boot camp is a general all encompassing from day one up until now. So he'll literally show you how to place a trade, how to open, how to close, what the spread means. He'll show you the different platforms. He'll go over market versus limit. He'll go over stop loss, things like that. And then the class I do here is kind of a lot more detail specifically tailored to how to understand the actual options flow. Any other questions on flow, black box, our Discord group? If you're in our Discord group, if you have questions on Discord, I can answer those. If not, feel free to check out for the day. I will wrap this up. I'll stick around for about 30 seconds in case you guys are typing questions. How do you cut a loss for options? There are so many strategies on how to manage trades. It would be impossible to get into it. For me personally, I base 100% of my entries and exits on support and resistance. So for me, if I'm in a call and it's out of resistance and it's getting rejected and the volume isn't there to bring it through, I'm probably closing that out. If I'm in a call and it's working against me, I've got a support level that I want it to hold. If that doesn't hold and it drops below, I'm out. I'll have multiple support levels, multiple resistance levels, and I'm just watching the volume as it gets to a level. And if it breaks through that level, I'm out. And I've got a video on YouTube that is how to manage your losses. And it's two examples of really clear cut trades that we took. And if you didn't cut the loss, it shows you the trade at the end of the day. If you didn't cut the loss, what it would have looked like. If you go to seven star traders on YouTube, you'll see that bug. That is me everywhere. There's a video on here, manage your losses. This shows you one of the alerts that we took and it shows you that I cut the loss for, I think it was like three or $4 loss. 
per contract. And the reason I cut the trade was because it broke a support level. And I took a three or $4 per contract loss, but at the end of the day, had I not taken that three or $4 per contract loss, it would have been something like 15 or $20 per contract. So if you're doing size, that's gonna add up. So that's one of those things where for me personally, my cuts are, I don't do a specific percentage because if I say I'm gonna cut it at 12%, 12% means nothing to the market. It's just a random number that I picked up. If I say I'm gonna cut it 30%, it's just a random number that means something to me. It doesn't mean anything to the market. So if I say I'm gonna cut it 30%, the market doesn't care what 30% means. The market does care where support and resistance are, it's supply and demand, where are their buyers, where are their sellers. So if I'm cutting at a predetermined number, and let's say 30 cents below that number is a demand area where people are gonna step in and buy it, I'm gonna cut it, it's gonna drop 30 cents and then people are gonna buy, step in and buy it and drive the price up, but I'm already out of the position. So I don't like using a specific percentage. I use support and resistance. If I'm in a call and it breaks the support, I'm out. If I'm in a put and it breaks through a resistance, I'm out. You want to size your trades accordingly so that it can go to support and resistance and not stop you out of a trade. If you're not giving it enough room to hit support or resistance, you're not giving yourself a chance to make money in that trade. So if you buy 10 contracts and it drops 10 cents and you freak out and sell, and support was 17 cents below that, you really have to size down to allow yourself to get that full 17 cent drop. I don't like Tesla, ha, huh, you feel the same way. <laughs> yes. The reason for that, Shannon, is just, it's such a volatile ticker that you can be up 20% in a contract, you can take a sip of water, look back at your screen and you're down 40%. You're like, what the, what, how? How did that just happen, how? That's Tesla for you. So Tesla is on my do not trade list. I do cheat that on Fridays when the contracts are 60 cents or $1.20 or $1.80. I do trade Tesla on Fridays because I love same day expiration action. And I love Tesla and Amazon on Fridays because those tickers move so much. You can literally get a $2 contract and in seven minutes, those are $600. 30 minutes later, a $2 contract can be $1,400. The downside is a $200 contract 38 seconds later can be 120. So Tesla is one of those things it's, it's on my do not trade list until it's a Friday. Sometimes Thursday, those contracts are cheap enough. And Thursday, if it moves, you'll get good movement in those contracts as well. So I will play those on Thursdays and Fridays. Otherwise, the first half of the week, they're just on my do not trade list. I just don't like Tesla. I've traded it plenty of times and just gotten killed on it. I'll be up 600 bucks in like seven minutes one day, close the trade, I'm feeling good. The next day I give back that 600 and another 600. And I'm like, man, I, why, did it, why did I touch it? I was up 600 bucks yesterday. Why did I just touch it today? Why, why, why? And then the next day I'll make 300 bucks. I'll be like, okay, I got in and out really quick. I'm safe. Oh, the next day, let me try it one more time. Nope, that 300 is gone and there's another 800 with it. So Tesla, I just don't like, me personally. I'm not good at trading Tesla. Now, when those contracts are cheaper and it's 200 bucks for a contract, and I know clear defined support and resistance, I'm okay trading Tesla. I'm not gonna spend $4,000 on a Monday or Tuesday to trade Tesla. I just don't like it. Discord, there are so many traders. How do I know each one's style? You just kind of get a feel for them. If you're not in Discord frequently, it's hard to do. Maria is an amazing, probably the best you will ever see at scalping. She doesn't post all of her trades, but she scalps in and out millions of times a day. So if you like really quick short-term trades, she is amazing. She does swing a few as well, but the majority of her style is kind of quick trading in and out. Kang is amazing with Amazon and Tesla, mostly day trades. He does swing a few. Bender is good with swinging and he likes ABBV. So I think he does some of the bios. He's really good with those. Jenny B does the risky AF, but she is just amazing with her trades. She'll have a ton of 100% trades. She is kind of a mix of swing and day trade. I think she's probably mostly day trade, but she does swing a few here and there. 
Spectre is amazing at everything he touches. He does go long and short, so if you like short, you can follow him. He does a lot of after hours trading, so if you do after hours trading, you can follow him on those. So it's just a matter of, of watching them and getting a feel for how they trade. For the Amazon put we talked about Monday, it's $500, contract $7. Let's say the stock on Friday is $480. Will I be making money or losing because of time decay? If it's going in the right direction, it will typically outpace time decay by quite a bit. So you only really worry about time decay if it's moving against you and if it's a shorter term expiration. So if you have something for six months out, every day that goes by, you're losing money to decay, but it's it's minimal. If you have a contract that expires in two or three days, that decay is gonna be a lot greater. So you wanna look at the time frame. If it's 500 on Monday and Friday, the, the ticker is 480, it's a $20 move over the course of a week. I don't know if those contracts are really gonna be monster moves. It should be profitable for sure. But I'd have to look at the specific contract. It also depends on if that's in the money or out of the money. Shannon, you are welcome for that support resistance video. It is a long video, so I understand if it takes time to work through it. I had no intentions of that being four and a half hours long, but the material presents itself in such a way that I didn't want to skip it. I didn't want to race through it. I've gotten a few people saying, you know what, it's kind of long. And if that's the case, don't watch it. But then also don't complain that you don't understand support and resistance. And I've gotten a million more compliments on it than I have people complaining about the length. So I'm okay with the people that don't like how long it is. Reiko, new member. Thank you so much for the very informative class. You are welcome and welcome to Blackbox. Thanks for being a part of the group. So if you guys have questions on where to reach me, if you're a member of Blackbox, obviously Discord, you can send me private messages. In the main chat room, you can type at moderators and that will reach all of us. If you have a question that needs attention, type at moderators, because we don't always watch the chat. But if you type at moderators, we get a message that pops up that says, hey, someone's trying to talk to you. So on Discord, I am at Seven Star Mike. On Twitter, I am at Seven Star Mike. On Instagram, I am at Seven Star Mike. On YouTube, I am at Seven Star Traders. So you can find me in multiple formats. Whatever you like to use for social media, you can find me on any of those. Jenny, the video is on Seven Star Traders. Go to YouTube, this one here, Trading Basics, Support and Resistance. You will see it is four and a half hours long, but it covers the basics of support and resistance. And support and resistance is 100% how we, in the Discord room, in Black Box, most of us trade 100% entries and exits are based on support and resistance. So if you have time to watch that, even watch it in 30 minute increments, an hour here, an hour there, whatever it is, it covers what support and resistance is and how we use it. And that's really the basics for entry and exit for almost all of our trades. Actually for all, of, even if we're trading on a news headline, we're looking at support and resistance levels. What is dark pool? Dark pool is a whole nother topic. Go on Discord and talk to Mel Stone. She is the dark pool expert. Dark pool is basically large trades from institutions where they don't want to go to the open market. So if I'm trying to unload 2 million shares, I can go to dark pool, which is a place I can buy or sell 2 million shares and the open market doesn't see it right away. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. So the dark pool is basically a way to unload or buy large positions from the institutions with kind of covering your tracks from the general market. It's dark, which means we don't get to see those trades. They are reported, so we do see them eventually. 
but go to Discord. Melstone actually has a room called Darkpool. I think it's called Darkpool Data. You can go through there, and she has some pinned messages on what Darkpool is. Any other questions on Discord, Blackbox, how we use Flow? Anything whatsoever pertaining to unusual options activity? Again, I'll stick around for about 30 seconds to see if any questions come through. Thank you for attending. Again, if you do have questions, you can reach me on Discord at 7 Star Mike. If you're not a part of Blackbox and you were participating in this presentation, you probably found out about this because I posted on Twitter. So that would mean you follow me or you've seen the Twitter account. You can follow me there. You can ask me questions on Twitter. I will get back to you. If you're not a member of Blackbox, I'm not gonna try and sell this and force it down your throat, but I will still answer your questions if you took part in this seminar. So reach out to me on Twitter and say, hey, you know what? I took that seminar, I had a question on the bid or I had a question on the colors of your scanner. How does it equate to this? Even if you're not a member of Blackbox, I will answer your questions on how we use our scanner. So reach out to me on Twitter. If you're part of Blackbox, reach out to me on Discord. I'm pretty active there after hours. Send me a private message or just tag me in the main chat room and I will see that. And I don't see any more questions coming in. So on that note, thank you guys for joining. You can always reach out with questions. It's confusing at first. With seat time, I promise you it gets easier. If you have any questions, please don't try to interpret it. Don't try to guess. Reach out, ask for explanations. We want you guys to be super successful. And on that note, I will see you guys back in Discord. Thank you for joining and good luck with the rest of the day. Stay green.